Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and Fill me completely 
you, Lord. We love to praise you, to lift our hands, Lord. Would you touch us, God? We thank you for being here in this place, Lord. We thank you for your presence, your Holy Spirit here with us, Lord. God, we just want to pour out our praises to you. Would you hear them? God, we have come this morning to hear from you as we look into your word. So teach us, Lord. Make us more like you. Help us to give you a little bit more of ourselves this morning. Give us understanding. Give us ears to hear, Lord. And help us put away the distraction. We love you so much. Would you continue to bless this time of worship now? In your name, amen. You may be seated. you are gentle you are so kind I lay my life at your feet do what you
Lord, you are gentle. You are so kind. I lay my life at your feet. Do what you to say find their way at the sound of your great name dark and dead feel no shame at the sound of your great name every Of your great name, the enemy he has to leave at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb.
Step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me So highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, awful of sin. Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all 
into this world and you opened our eyes to your love and your grace and your mercy. And here we are today standing, singing, here is my life, God. I worship you. Lord, what a miracle when you think about it, that, Lord, we would surrender our lives to you. Leave, Lord... uh, This world really, as your word says, really has nothing to offer compared to what you have for us. And Lord, what a what an amazing thing it is to think about, Lord, the benefits that we have in Christ. Eternal life, forgiveness of sins. Lord, a life, a life worth living, a life full of hope. That this life. Lord, when it's over, we have an eternal life as well, God. We just keep going as Christians, Lord. New bodies, Lord, that won't get sick. Lord, that won't die. Lord, I I can't even imagine, Lord, what that's going to be like. But I'm ready. And so, Lord, this morning, anoint your word, Lord, as we look at it. Continue to pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. Draw us closer to yourself this morning, God. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You know, before you sit down, why don't you turn around and tell somebody that Jesus loves them. I seen you. Morning, morning. I love it. Those of you that are watching online this morning, um, Jesus loves you. <laughs> I, I can't shake your hand, but here, there you go. Steve, good to see. Tim. Wonderful, wonderful. You know, every Sunday I have to get up here the past few months and and just continue to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone that's been um, praying and helping and um, trying to get our new church uh, ready uh, for occupancy. And last Friday, 
Um, we had the build. We had the building inspectors come in from Foley to give us our final uh, and give us our CO so we can start meeting in the new church. And I asked everybody to pray, and we passed. So, so we have our occupancy permit. Um, they only found two small little things. Um, but I've been dealing with the city now going on 12 years. So I know the, the city inspectors. And so um, the last time we had a wedding at the church about four months ago for Mr. Parker's wedding, uh, I was the one that put the stuck the new handicap, you know, in the bathroom stickers on the wall. And, and when uh, the building inspector looked at it and said, Pastor Joe, there he goes, those signs, they got to be 60 inches from the bottom to the top. And I said, I said, uh, Doug, who do you think hung those things? He goes, I don't know. I go, I did. I'm only 60 inches tall. He goes, come on, pastor. You know, but anyway, we fixed those already a long time ago. So they're at 60 inches. So the only thing that they could find was um, we don't have an address on the, on the building. Um, and we need that for emergency purposes. So um, our sign guys uh, making some letters that have to be five inches tall, one inch stroke. And we're going to put those on the window um, below the awning there. Um, if we like them, we'll keep them. If we don't, we'll figure out another place uh, to put some um, numbers for the for the address of the church. So we have our occupancy. So we're going to be vacating this place in two weeks. Well. Yeah, two weeks. So um, so Valentine's Day, the fourteenth, we will be uh, having our first service in the new church building. Um, yeah, so praise the Lord. So in case next Sunday you come in and you go, oh, where's the screen? Oh, where the where did all that go? Oh, well, it's gone. Okay? Are you going to be okay with that? Yeah. Okay, because we're going to be, we got to get we got to get everything over. We don't have to take all this sound equipment out. We have there's different sound equipment, but we do have to get some things over there um, in a couple of weeks. Um, the floors are the floors will all be completely done by next Saturday. We got to give a, um, hopefully maybe Friday. We got to give those floors a couple of days um, to seal up. So that's going on because the the foyer will be stained and um, clear coated, and the sanctuary will be stained and clear coated. Those are the only two floors left to do. The rest of the the rest of the building's done. So. Um, very excited about it. We'll be having our Valentine's Day dinner um, at the new church building as well, um, the 14th. Um, steak and chicken. So you get a pick. You can't have both. I know. I know. But you can pay for both if you like. <laughs> um, I know how he's going to work, though. His wife's going to get chicken. He's going to get steak, and they're going to they're gonna half it, and they're both going to have both. I already got you figured out. Um, but anyway... Um, we're going to have our Valentine's Day dinner. Alan already announced it, and there is child's care, child care. And so those of you that have little ones, um, we're going to have child care. And we will be having pizza for them. So we'll get some pizza for them. So anyway, a lot of things uh, happening, a lot of tra things transpiring. Now, those of you parents that are sitting in here this morning and you have children over here, I'm sorry already. I'm just going to apologize right now. Um, I went over to the children's ministry. And I told the kids, I said, can't you guys wait till we get to the new church building and you're going to be able to play on the playground? And the teacher goes, oh, my gosh, the pastor's in there and he's getting all these kids riled up. They all got up out of their seats, jumping up and down. And I said, but kids, you got, oh, I got, I got to ask you one thing. And they're all like looking at me like all intent. I said, at the end of church today, you have to talk to your daddies and you got to tell them they've got to come to the church and put it all together. <laughs> So, so we got to put all that equipment together in two weeks. So anyway, I just thought I'd, I just thought I'd warn you ahead of time. One kid said, I don't think my dad's coming. <laughs> and I ain't going to tell you who that was. But anyway, that's funny. So let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Jude. That's where we're going to be this morning. Chapter 2. Just seeing who's awake today. Just see who's awake. There is no chapter 2, so there's only 25 verses in the book of Jude. So we are going to do verses 12 through 19 this morning. We'll finish it next week. 
And then when we get to the new church, guess what? We start the book of Revelation. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty exciting. We also are going to have a baby dedication um, when we get to the new church. So there's a bunch of people excited about all kinds of things. So let's read verses 12 through 19, and then we will pray over. Anybody need a Bible? Raise your hand. We'll get you a Bible. We have Bibles. Anybody? Okay. So let's, let's read. Verse 12, book of Jude. Now it's on page 1,629 in my Bible. <laughs> These are spots in your love feasts, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars, for whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. And now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them all, their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And it's capital H, by the way. That means Jesus. Uh, verse 16. Uh, These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts. And they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. Father God, we thank you for this book of Jude. We thank you for these 25 verses. God, it seems like it would be a small book, but yet, Lord, each word in this book carries such weight, such meaning, Lord. It's a book in itself. And so, Lord, I just ask for your anointing upon your word that you would speak to your people today. Lord, they are truly your sheep of your pasture. And, Lord, I am just your servant, Lord, to bring forth your word. And so, Lord, do not allow me to say anything that is not of you. Lord, that everything would be of you and that we would all, once again, I, I, every time I open my Bible, every time I hear somebody teaching, from the Word of God, I, I, Lord, I want to be more like you in, in every way possible. And I know for me, Lord, um, and for all of us, it's a lifetime um, of, of changing um, that you work in us, Lord. But sometimes I think I'm the biggest project uh, around um, that needs the most work. But God, bless your Word as we look at it and truly give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you know, when I think about that, I'm the, I'm the biggest work that God has to work on. It has nothing to do with this, okay? Um, it, it has to do with the spiritual side of things. You know, I um, just so desire to be more like Christ, but the reality is it is it's a lifetime process. And so here the book of Jude has 25 verses in it, and Jude has written this epistle or this letter to help us understand what apostasy in the church looks like. And we been talking about apostasy. The whole, the whole book of Jude is about the apostates. Those are the people who bring in the apostasy and twist the word of God and make it what they want it to, to mean and make, and, and, they, and they twist it all up. Well, not only did Jude and Peter and John and the rest of the apostles have problems with apostates in the church, they knew we were going to have problems with apostates in the church, and they're everywhere. And so this little book, it's almost like Jude is preparing us for the end times because what's after the book of Jude? The book of Revelation, you know, and so we know, I mean, isn't it amazing to know how this all ends? You know, we know how it began, right, in the book of Genesis all the way through, and now we know how it's going to end. Now, the problem is we don't know, we don't have all the details of all the details before the rapture of the church takes place. We don't have all those details. We know what the world's going to be like. We know what it's going to look like. But we don't know how exactly all that takes place. 
And I think we're kind of like in the, in the middle of it right now. You know, all these things that are transpiring in our country and in everything else. I mean, truly, we were living in the last days. And so Jude paints us in incredible pictures of what the apostates look like. So we can recognize them. Last week, we looked at verse 11, and we saw Cain, the example of Cain, Balaam, and Korah um, from the Old Testament. And the week before that, Jude gave us three Old Testament examples of corporate apostasy. Well, he gave us God's people in Egypt when they were in captivity, um, the angels who did not keep their proper abode, and then he gave us the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, in our verses this morning, verses 12 and 13, Jude gives us six more pictures, six more pictures of apostates, or you can call them false teachers, um, because that's what they are, false teachers twisting the truth of God's word. So Jude here, in verse 12, calls them spots in your love feasts. Now, Peter wrote about these apostates as well, and he wrote about these spots in your love feasts, and Peter wrote and said they are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. So Peter, as well as Jude, are showing us that these apostates are, are pretty dangerous, um, and they infiltrate our love feast. Now, that's what they called the gathering of the church back in Jude and Peter's day. They would, they would meet for church. They would worship together. They would have a Bible study. And then they would have a potluck <laughs> every time they met. They would have food, and the, they would call these love feasts. Now, during Jude's day and Peter's day, the church was much different than, than today. They didn't have buildings. They met in homes, um, they, and they went from house to house. You can see how the church operated in the book of Acts um, chapter 2 uh, to re- get the whole gist of it. But in verse 46, they would go from house to fa- house with simplicity in their heart, breaking bread with one another, um, praying with one another, studying the word together, and, um, and, they, and it says in there in the book of Acts that they sold all their goods to bring all the, the monies together to help the saints in the church because they were just living in difficult times. People didn't, the, the wages were tough. A lot of um, um, poor people were a part of the church. And so when these love feasts would take place, you'd have all sorts of people and everybody brought what they could and then they all shared their meal, and, 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 and they enjoyed the fellowship. Now, I love that. I love breaking bread with one another. I love having a meal with somebody. I mean, I love having potlucks. Um, I, I love the dessert side of things. That's just me. You know, we had Pastor Stephen's wedding at the new church facility Saturday. The church parking lot, every single parking spot was full. It was kind of cool to see, wow, the church parking lot is full. Then there was rows of cars in the dirt area. You know, we're sitting on 15 acres. We have five acres cleared. Um, and, and then just all these people all around. And um, when the ceremony was over and, uh, and everybody, you know, was there at the, the food line, they had Olive Garden. Everybody was excited about it. But I looked over at the dessert table and there was nobody. So I got my cheesecake and I was good. And so, you know, um, and we, t- and it was just a great time of fellowship. There's just a wonderful time of, of when the church gets together, has Bible study, has worship, time of prayer, sharing a meal. It is, it is truly a great thing and, and a lot of love flowing around um, with everybody. But during Jude's time, just like in our time, there were these men called apostates who would creep into the fellowship, and, and Jude calls them filthy spots. Now, you read that, and you go, what is that? <laughs> and, and in the original language, in the Greek, it carries the meaning of hidden rocks, um, a rock in the sea, uh, a ledge or a root, a reef uh, in, the, in, the, in the water, so metaphorically speaking, speaks of men 
who by their conduct damage others morally and wreck them, as it were. So think of a, a mariner, a person who's um, navigating a boat. You know, um, when I first got here 12 years ago and, and we had a boat that we've had for, I don't know, 15 years, and it was a freshwater boat, and let me tell you, it did not fare well in the salt water. And, but I'll tell you what, you got to know how to navigate these waters because there's low tides. Yes, we hit sandbars. That's an easy one. But you hit a rock, you hit a reef. Anybody that has a boat knows that if you hit something on the bottom of your boat, that you are in trouble. <laughs> that, is the, that is what you are in, that you are floating, because if it sinks, you're going down, and hopefully you have life vests on right? You could poke a hole in the bottom of your boat. You can lose a prop on your boat. There's a lot of things that can happen when you hit a reef or you hit a bunch of hidden rocks under the water that you didn't see it. Um, it, it will cause a lot of damage. And so these apostates, these, these men who were twisting the truth and just wanted to cause a lot of havoc in the church, well, they, they came in to the church and they were a part of the church, but they had a motive behind them coming in. But when they came to the feast, Judas saying, they were causing havoc. They were like these hidden rocks. There were spots uh, in, your, in your love feast. And as a matter of fact, they would be the first ones in the food line loading up their plates. And then they would be looking at those less fortunate, those that were maybe poorer. And they would be looking at them like, wow, why are you even here? You know, you people don't even belong belong here. You know, and they would they would they were they were Jude called them shepherds who serve themselves, self serving shepherds. You know, shepherds are supposed to care for the sheep. Shepherds are supposed to love the sheep. Shepherds, you know, um, are are supposed to nurture the sheep. You know, feed the sheep, care for the sheep. Not these guys. These guys were self serving shepherds and they would talk down to the less fortunate they'd cause division in the church they would complain about the leadership and um and they used the love feast as an opportunity to prey on those christians who were most vulnerable and cause all kinds of problems um for them and and that's really what how do you tell a false shepherd or a false teacher or a, or an apost apostate well, they abuse and use the sheep to get what they want. That's how you tell. They, they, they abuse them, they use them to get what they want. Jude calls them, here in verse 12, empty clouds. What's an empty cloud? Uh, it's a, a clouds, well, you look at clouds, it promises rain. You look at a cloud, you go, oh, rain, you know, but they fail to produce and the farmer now is disappointed because his crop is desperately needing rain. And so when he sees the cloud, he goes, thank God we have rain coming on our, on our crops. And here come the clouds. And there ain't nothing in them. <laughs> they're useless. They're, they're, they're good for nothing. These false teachers or apostates look like men who can give spiritual hope and spiritual help and they boast of their abilities to do that, but they are unable to produce any spiritual help whatsoever. They mess you up. They give you false truths. They give you half-truths. And, and then now you're going like, oh, my gosh. You know, I, I thought you were supposed to, you were supposed to help me, and, and they don't. It's interesting. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 14 says, Whoever falsely boasts of giving is like clouds and wind without rain that it, it they're, they're just not gonna they're just not gonna produce now jude is not talking about people who make promises to others and and fail on their commitments that's not what he's talking about here we all fail we all you know we we don't follow through sometimes with what we, we said we're going to do, that we all are like that. that it's, it's, it's because we're human beings. We're not perfect people. It's interesting because when we came here 12 years ago, there was a group of young people, and, you know, being a 
a youth pastor for many years and a college pastor for many years and working with the young adults. And, you know, there was just, you know, Pastor Joe's leaving. We're going to, we're going, we're going to Alabama. And we're going to go help him start the church. And me and the wife had a big meeting with everybody and, and shared with them. And when it was all done, they all looked at us like, you, 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 you guys don't want us to go. And I said, you're right. We don't want you to go at all. But if God wants you to go, that's a different story. Then, then come on, if God wants you to go. Because you can't follow a man, right? You can't follow a person. You can't follow a ministry. I mean, I mean, there are great ministries and there are great preachers and there are godly men out there. And we listen to them on the radio or we, we buy their study tapes. And rightly so. But you got to follow Jesus because man will let you down. You know, people will let you down. And, and but these false teachers, oh my goodness sakes, they 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 would do anything, if you will, to have you follow them. Um, Jude says here they they serve only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds. They're late autumn trees without fruit. So here's the the fourth picture. They're they're trees without fruit. They. They speak a good game. You ever talk to those people? They speak a good game, but they have nothing to back it up. There's nothing to back it up. There's no fruit uh, in their life that, you know, speaks of any of that. Well, I, I, was, uh, I was the college uh, uh, equipment manager at, uh, you know, and then we, uh, you know, did training with them. And, uh, and uh, what school were you at? Well, I was at uh, this school for a week, and uh, then... Um, I transferred over to this other school for a couple of days, and then you know, uh, you know, you're talking a big game, buddy. But you have you have no history of anything that you're telling me. You know, um, they talk a big game. They have no fruit. Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven, verse fifteen through twenty. We need to turn there. You, you need to turn in your Bibles there. I, I think it's one of those verses that you need to know in your Bible. You need to know where it is. Because if we're going to discern between, you know, you know, everybody says they're a Christian, but their life don't line up with it, right? Everybody says they go to church, but that don't mean anything. Um, you know, I'm even, I'm even a born-again believer. Are you really? Then why are you continuing in this if you're born again? I mean, are you really born again? Because the Bible says you're a new creation. The old things have passed away, become all things have become new. So Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 gives us a great uh, analogy here of, of how you can know who's, who's real and who's not. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So these, these false Christians or these false prophets or these people who say this that have no fruit in their lives, they look like you. They, they talk like, China, what do they call it, Christianese? Christianese, you know, like, oh, praise the Lord and hallelujah and praise God and thank you, Jesus. And, you know, God is so good. And, and they, you know, they're in sheep's clothing. They're wolves in sheep's clothing, Jesus. You've got to be careful. Um, he says, you will know them by their fruits, Okay. He says, do men gather grapes from thorn, thorn bushes or figs from thistles? The answer is no. If you want an orange, you go to an orange tree. You want an apple, you go to an apple tree. You want grapes, you, you don't go to the berry bush. <laughs> you go to the grapevine, right? Ever, even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Um, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. You know, you can't be a bad tree and bear good fruit. Jesus says it's impossible. You know, and you think about that. Now, he's not, he's not, Jesus is not saying here we're supposed to be perfect. He's not saying here oh, you're supposed to have all this wonderful fruit because sometimes we don't have good fruit, right? We sometimes, you know, I, oh, I said something I, sh I shouldn't have said. I thought something I, sh I, sh I shouldn't have thought. You know, uh, I did this and I shouldn't have done. We are, we are a work in progress, folks. We are a work in progress. This is not what Jesus is saying. But you know what? People know I'm a Christian, and they can look at my life, and they can look at the fruit of my life, and they can look at my everyday life, and they can look at last year, and the year before, and the year before, and the year. You know, I've been walking with the Lord since I was 28, and it's just been the most amazing roller coaster 
of my whole entire life. And when I say roller coaster, it just been, I mean, there's been some incredible times. There's been difficult times. You know, that's life. You call that life. Christians have problems in their lives. You go through cancer. You go through deaths. You have, dip, you lose a job. You, Christians aren't exempt from any of that. People think when you come to Jesus, everything now is going to be beautiful. Roses, you know, you wear it, you, know, you get your Christian glasses and you see everything through roses, you know, rose glasses. No, there are, there are, there are, we have things that go on in our lives. It's called life. We do life. But we bear good fruit. I believe trials and problems and challenges in our life is God's way of letting us show the world, those around us, our friends, family, whoever, that, you know what, man, how did they do this? Well, you know what, they trusted in Christ. See, the rubber meets the road when the trial comes, what, what you really truly believe. Oh, I'm a believer. I trust Christ. I, I love the Lord. And then a trial comes, and next thing you know, they're hightailing out. I don't come to church no more. You don't see them again, and they're mad at God. Well, what does that tell you? Where's the, what kind of fruit is that? You know? And that happens, by the way. And those of us who are spiritual, the Bible says we need to go after them. We don't forget about them. We don't throw them away. We don't, you know, I think the Christ, Christians are they're known for shooting and, and, and killing their wounded. <laughs> That's what Christians do. No, they're not allowed in the church anymore. Kick them out. They're no good. Get rid of them. Um, but even so, every good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire, therefore by their fruits you will know them. Now, this is Jesus' words. These aren't my words. These are Jesus' words. So false teachers are not only fruitless, they are rootless, <laughs> Jesus said. I mean, Jude says here, they are rootless. They are twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Okay, so they, they have no roots. Now, large congregations does not always mean they are thriving Bible teaching spirit-filled ministries. Okay, look at I can own 20 acres of land and have over 2,000, 3,000 trees on it, and they're all fruit trees. Maybe they're all satsuma trees, and they're all dead. They're all dead. It's, it's, it, they're, it's worthless. They're useless. They're good for nothing. Just because I have all this acreage and I have all these trees doesn't mean anything. We have to look at the fruit of the ministry. What is the fruit of the ministry? What, is the, what, are, what are the fruit of those that are in the ministry? What are, kind of fruit are they bearing? What fruit is being produced in their lives? <clears throat> what does their marriage look like? What does their community life look like? What does their Jesus life look like? You know? And you can't sit there and judge things by how small something is or how big something is. You can only judge by the fruit um, of what's coming out. That, this is what Jude is talking about. And so the fifth picture Jude gives us is he calls these false teachers... Raging waves, he says here. Raging waves of the sea. Now, I love the Gulf. I love going out on, on a fishing boat. I enjoy that. But I'm not going when a hurricane's coming. Okay, I'm not, I mean, I'm not that guy. I'm not, you know, you see those uh, on the, TV channels, you know, the, the guys that are out getting the Alaskan king crabs, you know, and they're out in the middle of the, 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 the Baltic Sea and raging waves, and you see snow and ice on the edges of their boat. Uh-uh. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not all about that at all. You know, I don't like to go out in the sea when it's, when it's stormy or rough because usually I get sick, and probably you might too. So he's calling them raging waves and he's not calling them raging waves because they're like powerful um like a raging raging wave but he's he's comparing them to a raging wave 
because of their great pride and their great arrogance causes much disturbance. That's what these false teachers do. They cause much disturbance. Have you ever been, have you ever walked uh, on, the, on, the, on the sand after a storm down at the Gulf or down at Fort Morgan where the, the, the beach is there or walk along the ocean? The Gulf's not an ocean. Um, but have you walked along the, the seashore of an ocean after a great storm? Anybody ever walk the, the sand after a storm? Anybody? What is there? What? All kinds of garbage. All kinds of garbage, yes. All kinds of debris. There's all kinds of garbage. There's all kinds of stuff. You don't even know where this piece of wood came from or this glass bottle or whatever this whatever it is. You have no idea where it's come from. And that these false teachers, I mean, when they're done with you, there's there's debris and garbage and stuff scattered all over. You know, they've messed up all kinds of people's lives, is what Jude is saying. He, the, the raging waves. And then he says, and, and foaming up their own shame. You know, to their own shame. I don't know if you've ever seen when the waves break and, and, and there's foam on top of the, on the water. It's just coming up to the shore. It's, just, it's, it's, it's gross. You don't want to go swimming in that. Um, and, and this is what he's, he's, he's calling... Um, these these false teachers, but then he used, and then the sixth picture he gives us, the last picture he gives us, he calls them wandering stars. These are apostates. These this is this is what they kind of look like. This is how they act, if you will, um, wandering stars. Now he's not talking about planets. He's not talking about stars that exist in the sky that have been studied over thousands of years because we know that there are stars up there that have been studied. And, and, and you know, you follow the stars sometimes. You know, you're out on a boat. You know where that star is. Go, you know, go north. That'll, 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 you know, people traveled by the stars. They could count on the stars. Where's the moon at? Where's the, where's the sun going down? Where's the sun going up? Planets, you will, you know, stuff you can count on. He says these false teachers, these false prophets, these apostates, they're like wandering stars, you know, um, like a shooting star, you know. I love watching shooting stars, right? I always wonder, where did it land? <laughs> you know, oh, did it burned up in the atmosphere, you know. But there have been sh- shooting stars that are so big that they make it through the atmosphere and, and land somewhere. Um, this is what Jude is talking about, um, Wandering stars are going to lead you astray. Apostates and false teachers will lead you astray. So here are these six pictures that he gives us in these, in these two verses. He says, for whom is reserved the blackness and darkness of darkness forever? False teachers, apostates, they're not saved. They're, they're, they're going to go to eternal judgment. Um, they don't know that. Maybe they do know that. I don't know, but that's what the scriptures say. Blackness and darkness forever. Now, verses 14 and 15 tells us of their certain judgment that is going to come. It says in verse 14, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, Jesus, capital H. Now, here Jude quotes something very interesting. He quotes from an ancient book called the Book of Enoch. Maybe some of you Bible students here um, uh, have heard of that before. Maybe some of you here know the name Tertullian, a man named Tertullian. Um, go look uh, up this man. Um, he was part of the early church, highly respected. Um, Tertullian tells us that the book of Enoch's prophecies were preserved by Noah in the ark. And they, that they continued and were read until the times of the apostles. 
But because they contained many famous testimonies concerning Jesus Christ, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? The testimonies of Jesus. Well, there were some testimonies in, in the book of Enoch, which the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, um, out of malice, they suppressed and abolished the whole book. It's like the whole book was almost completely gone. So when you look up this man, Tertullian, who is he and how, is he reputable? Well, he was a priest. He was, the first, he was one of the first Christian authors. He was a historian of sorts. He was a leader in the Christian church in Africa and was well respected by the apostles in the early church. So he is a very well respected um, man of the scriptures. So Enoch is also in our Bibles, by the way. You can find Enoch uh, in Genesis chapter 5, and you can find Enoch in Hebrews chapter 11. But the ancient book of Enoch was not received as Scripture. It was not put in our Bibles for a reason when they put the Bible together. It just didn't hold true to what was spoken of in the Old Testament and what was written in the New Testament, because it all is a one picture here from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And Enoch was not um, one of those books that were included in the canon of Scripture. Um, but it was highly respected among both the believing Jews and the early Christians. But here's the point of it. You know, you, you, sometimes we read things in the Bible and we don't even know why it's even in there. If it's in there, it's a reason that it's in there. There's a point for it. God is a very detailed God, if you haven't noticed. Jude did not quote from Enoch to tell us anything new. That's the problem with some of these books that are not included in the scriptures. It's always like there's something new in it, but it's not scriptural. You find it nowhere else in the Bible, so they left it out. But Jude wasn't quoting Enoch to tell us anything new, but to give a vivid description of what the Bible already teaches, showing us that even outside resources at times support biblical truths. Because what does Enoch say? What does it say here? Behold, the, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints. Where do you find that? Book of Revelation. Because when we as a church get raptured and we're having the marriage supper of the Lamb and the seven-year tribulation is taking place and all of a sudden Jesus uh, takes a nap and goes, okay, let's go, time to go. He's going to get on his white horse and, and the saints are riding with him down onto this earth and we will rule and reign with Christ for the millennial kingdom, which is a literal thousand-year reign of Christ. You will have your new bodies. You will not get sick. You will not die. And we will be judging, if you will, on the earth along with Christ. Could you imagine a thousand years of a perfect world? Nope, can't. <laughs> but that's gonna, it's going to happen after the, after the tribulation period is over. And so we'll get to all of that when we get to the book of Revelation. So now what's interesting, and I don't know if you know this or not, but the Apostle Paul also quoted non-biblical sources, and at least three different occasions in the scriptures. If you want to write them down, here they are. Acts 17, 28, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, and Titus 1, 12. But once again, this wasn't to proclaim a new truth, but to support an already established principle. Again. So it's not like Jude did something that's out of character or not script, you know, not scriptural. The apostle Paul also did it as well. Okay, sorry, I went on fast. Acts 17, 28, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, and Titus 1, 12. You're welcome. I love that. I love it. Um, so Jude nor the Apostle Paul were insinuating that the non-biblical sources they were quoting were inspired or written by God through man, like the Bibles we hold in our hands today. They were just quoting what the scriptures were already stating. It's very important because people, apostates try to trip you up on this stuff, by the way. <laughs> they will try to trip you up on this stuff. Oh, yeah, but, you know, your Bible, you know, let me tell you what it really, what it really means. Um,
All right. Verse 16. We're almost there. Jude now exposes their tactics. Here's, here's the tactics of the apostate. Here's the, here's the tactics of the um, false teacher. These are grumblers. Why does a pastor teach that? Why do they believe in that? Why do they do that? Da, 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 da. They're grumblers. They're complainers. They're walking around to their own lusts. They want to plead. They're, they're self-shepherds, right? It's all about them. Um, and, they, they, and they mouth great swelling words. There's your great waves again. Great swelling words. Um, flattering people to gain advantage. False teachers, false prophets, apostates, they always want you to get on their side of the fence. You know what? Let me tell you what the real truth is. Come on on my side. It's interesting. I was um, driving to church this morning, and I had to do a few things early. And so I put on one channel, and it was a local church on, our, on, our, on the radio station. And I, and, and I began to listen to it, and, and it, I don't know, five, ten minutes into it, I just went, oh, my gosh. I had to turn it off. It was horrible what, they were, what the preacher was yelling at the people about, why they weren't being blessed. Because they weren't giving, you know, why you're, you know, this, that, the other. It was the most horrible, 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 and I didn't even listen to the whole message. I, ha I had to turn it off. It was so bad. Um, flattering people to gain advantage. What was the advantage of that message? Well, you're all messed up because you're not giving. That's why. You're messed up. And you're not being blessed because you're not giving. That was the message. My heart sunk deep. I felt like driving over to that church and saying, telling everybody, run! <laughs> Get out! Quick! My goodness sakes, no wonder people don't want to go to church anymore. No wonder, you know, thank God for the internet. Some, a lot of people are here this morning because they've watched for what, months to see what this little short fat guy is going to say from the pulpit. Me, they're watching online to see, is he going to share from the Bible? What is he going to do? What are they doing over there? What kind of music are they playing? And I commend you for that because going to church is important. It's very important so we can grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But if you're not getting the word and you're not getting taught, well, what do you, you know, that's why you send your kids to school, right? To learn something. And if they ain't learning something, you know, you're going as a parent to figure out what's going on here. Many Christians. I love when people, after a study, they, qu they question what I said. And they're not questioning me because, because they're challenging me. They're questioning me about something that was in the scriptures that maybe they haven't heard before or taught before. And it's causing them to think about what they have been taught. That's good. That's awesome. I love getting emails like that. I welcome them. So does the baby. The baby's saying, I'm hungry. I got to go. Um, but verse 17 says, but you, beloved, this is Jude saying, but you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their, un ungod their own ungodly lusts. Folks, why are we so upset with the way things are right now? Because the Bible said it's going to be this way. Okay, you might not be happy with it. I'm not happy with it. I'm not happy with the policies. I'm not happy with the laws. I'm not happy with what's going through the courts. I'm not happy with leaving God out of this and God out of I'm not happy about any of it. But you know what? The Bible says this is how it's going to be in the last days. So why are, we, why are our feathers all worked up and, and, and we're all mad and all upset? Because Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. And, and what, well, so what are we supposed to be doing? Be all upset about it? Or should we like be saying, you know what? Let me tell you something, Fred. If you, your name's Fred this morning, I'm not calling you out. But, you know, let me, Fred, let me tell you something. You know, I don't like it either. But let me tell you something. The, the Lord Jesus rose from the grave. 
He, he died for your sins on the cross. And he said that all who believe in him will have everlasting life. You see, we're pilgrims passing through, Fred. This is in our home. And the Bible says that, you know what, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. The government's going to be messed up. There's going to be pestilences everywhere. Oh, Joe, what are, pe well, Fred, pestilences are diseases. You mean like COVID? Yes, Fred, like COVID. And it's going to be more COVIDs and more this and more that and more this. Because in the end times, that's what it's going to look like. Earthquakes everywhere, famine taking place, stars falling out of the sky. Fred, I hope we're not here for that. You know, this is what it's going to look like. The problem is we don't want it to look like that. We want to continue on and continue loving our families and watching our grandkids grow and watching them get married and watching them have kids and on and on and on that goes. But the reality is Jesus is coming back, folks. I don't know when. And, you know, this could be my last sermon today. The last one. Because when I say amen and the worship team comes up, could you imagine if, if all of a sudden the trumpet sounded? Yeah, hallelujah. Woo! You can have my house. You can have my car. You can do have everything. My house is under construction right now. Sally messed it up, but you can have it anyway. You know, this is not our home. And Jude's saying, don't get, don't get caught up with the lies. Don't get caught up with the false preachers, the false messages, those that don't even share the Bible, they give you a snippet, they give you an appetizer, we're going to go through series, whatever, and, and you know, we need to know this word, we need, to know this, we need to know this book, we need to know what God said, and he says, these guys are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit, they're not filled with the spirit, and it, this word sensual in this context that Jude uses it has nothing to do with sexual attractiveness. It describes the person who lives only by and for what he can get through his physical senses. And he lives this way selfishly. That's what false teachers do. More money. More people, more this. It's all about me, my life, and what I can get from all y'all so I can do well. His motto is, if it feels good, do it. And these folks, you know what? If you, Their motto also is, how can it be wrong if it feels so right? How can it be wrong if it feels so right? Well, you're, you got issues. <laughs> you got issues. You know, if God calls it sin, then we call it sin. If God doesn't like it, we don't like it. What, what, what are, we stood and we did, we did the worship song. You know, our lives belong to you, Lord. I'm, I'm going to worship you with my life. The Bible says you can't have two masters. You can only have one. I'm thankful for the book of Jude. Next week, Jude forgets about all the apostates. And he says, now, let's build our lives on Christ. That's next week. Building our lives on Christ. Maintain your life with God because he's coming back. Amen? Amen. Amen. Worship team, come on up. Father God, we thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for all these wonderful people, Lord, that you brought here today. Lord, I ask for your abundant blessing upon their lives. Lord, each person here, Lord, has their own circle of influence, God. And Lord, I pray that we would just be in tune with your Holy Spirit, God. So many lost people around us, Lord. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. And, um, and some people are in church and they're lost. And so, Lord, you've called us for such a time as this, God, in the days in which we live. 2021, January. And so, Lord, um, let us not keep silence, God. Let us not, Lord, if you will, put our heads in the sand and, and think that it's all just going to go away. Oh, it's going to go away, all right. Um, and everybody that's a non-believer, they're going to go away too. But a lot of people that we know and we love, Lord, don't have a relationship with you. And that's the part that breaks our heart. So, Lord, I pray that it would break our hearts enough to speak truth and love and compassion. 
Lord, to those that we love, those that we care about, even the stranger, the downhearted, God. Um, you love everybody, Lord, for God so loved the world. That's everybody um, that he gave his life for the whole world. And those who receive it and those who believe it will have everlasting life. And so, God, use us this week. Use us even today as we go, Lord, whether it's the restaurant we're going to be at. Maybe maybe we can pray for the waitress or the waiter, Lord, the, the fast food person handing us our bag. Um, Maybe it's at the gas station. We have to pay for our fuel. Lord, I don't know, Lord, where we're all going to be today. But, Lord, let us bring glory and honor to you in whatever it is we do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for the last song. Stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Everyone sing to that song. Holy is the Lord Almighty. God, would we reflect that in the way we act, in the way that we speak, in the way that we interact with those around us. God, give us the power of your Holy Spirit to live our lives in a way pleasing to you. Bless this church. In your name, amen.